boys and girls, Brad the Guitologist here. A couple of years back, a viewer of my channel sent me an email that intrigued me immensely. He described a quarter inch reel-to-reel -reel tape he wanted to send me, which he claimed contained interviews with some of the most famous musical artists of the 20th century. The tape had been acquired at an auction in a small town in Iowa in the late 1980s and was given to him by his brother-in-law. He said it featured a long-lost 1967 interview with the late Johnny Cash. Naturally, I was skeptical. Surely I thought, this must be something taped off the radio or off a vinyl LP back in the day, something like that. The odds of an undocumented Johnny Cash interview surfacing at a hayseed auction in the middle of BFE had to be next to nil. But still, my interest was piqued. And as a huge fan of Johnny Cash, heck, as someone with his portrait on my wall, I wasn't about to say no to someone wanting to send me something that might turn out to be legit, put it that way. A week or so later, the tape arrived in the mail and I opened the package and showed the contents on my channel. I got a few comments from people who said they'd like to hear the tape, but the response wasn't what I'd consider overwhelming, and back in the box it went. There it stayed for over two years, out of sight and nearly out of mind. Several personal setbacks and a global pandemic later and I'm finally able to dust off my early 70s Sony reel-to-reel -reel tape machine and attempt to play this mysterious tape. I probably own about 15 of these old machines, but this was the only one that I trusted to play the tape without destroying it. After several failed attempts to get the audio to output to my desk mixer, I decided to open the unit and do some prodding around to see where I'm dropping signal. Leave it to me to turn a simple task into a protracted, drawn-out ordeal. It takes a while to figure out what the problem was, and it was just some dirty RCA output jacks. Now, what are the odds of that, am I right, Fender amp owners? So the tape begins, and I hear the interviewer's voice, and instantly, I mistake it for the voice of Johnny Cash himself. The man conducting the interviews is a Seattle desk jockey named Bobby Wooten. No, not the same Bobby Wooten who would later become Johnny Cash's guitar player after the sudden death of Luther Perkins. Another Bobby Wooten, who liked Johnny, and the other Bobby too, just happened to also come originally from Arkansas, and happened to sound almost exactly like Johnny Cash. The world is really silly sometimes. Anyway, so this deep southern Johnny-like drawl comes on the tape and introduces Carl Perkins. Yes, that Carl Perkins. And the first interview begins, and right away, I know the chances of this being legit just went way up. So for those who don't know, Carl Perkins, no relation to Johnny's guitarist Luther Perkins, I know, silly world again, was one of the original Sun Records artists, along with Johnny Cash, Elvis Presley, and Jerry Lee Lewis, to bring the rock and roll sound to a wider and wider audience. He was the writer of Blue Suede Shoes, arguably the most famous rock and roll song of all time. In this interview, Perkins describes the disappointment of not being able to perform on the Perry Como show. An automobile accident had prevented him from performing on that show back in 1955, and it had been a bitter disappointment for him professionally. He had just recorded Blue Suede Shoes, and it was already in the charts, but this accident put a serious damper on his professional career at the time. Johnny Cash would later say in his 1998 autobiography that if not for that accident, Perkins might have been the first to break the mainstream out of the Sun Records bunch, and might have been bigger than Elvis. Instead, due to the accident, it was Elvis who broke first, and the rest is history. This is Carl Perkins backstage at the Seattle Opera House in Seattle, Washington. I've known Carl for quite a while. He's one of the finest talents I've ever known. He sings, he picks, he writes songs. Uh, I heard that once, Carl, that you went in the studio to record a song that had never been written, and you recorded this thing, or rather you wrote the song while you were recording it. Was that true, or somebody put me on? No, you heard it right, Bob. Uh... That was the backside of Blue Suede Shoes, a thing called Honey Don't, that later uh, Ringo Starr of the Beatles had a big record of this thing. I actually wrote it in the Sun studio. Uh, well, just, that, that really is something else, to get up before a microphone to record a song that's never been written. <laughs> well, that's, that's the way it happened, and it was in 1955, and uh, about 
November of 1955. How'd you get started in this business, Carl? Well, I guess, Bob, kind of like a lot of the guys I've talked to, I practically worried everybody to death. I was just about run off from home by the old man with my guitar in my early days. Uh, I sent tapes to all the major uh, recording companies, and finally the little uh, Sun Record Company down in Memphis, who had a... a started at that time a boy by the name of Elvis Presley mm -hmm. and Elvis had just recorded his first record so I had two brothers working with me and the boy that's playing drums with Johnny Cash now uh, W.S. Holland we four uh, went down there and I talked him into listening to us and he liked one of our songs, which was one side of my first record, a thing called Movie Mag. And he told me to go home and, and write me another one, and he would put out a record. So uh, you can imagine how long it took to be back. <laughs> and then you had one big one, Blue Suede Shoes, a big hit all across the country. And uh, it was number one, wasn't it? Yeah, Bob, it was. Uh, and incidentally, I... I don't want to sound like I'm bragging about this, but it uh, uh, you may not know it. A lot of people I talked to uh, had forgotten, but this song, Blue Suede Shoes, was the first record to ever be number one in all three categories of music, pop, country, and rhythm and blues. And uh, this happened in uh, 1956. It was released January the 1st. And uh, along about March uh, the 15th, somewhere in that uh, vicinity, it became the first song to ever go in all three charts to the number one position. What happened after Blue Suede Shoes, Carl? Well, Bob, I guess the saddest, uh, most disappointing thing of my life at that time, needless to say, been a a struggling, hard-working country boy, as me and my brothers were. Uh, we were real uh, keyed up to play the big places we dreamed of and go on the big shows, you know. And on March the 22nd in 1956, I was to be on the Perry Como show the 24th, which at that time, uh, nobody in the rock and roll field had ever been on a national television show, Elvis or any of them, uh, we would have been first, which, uh, you know, it don't hurt to be first in something like this. But we had a real serious car accident uh, two days on a Thursday morning before Saturday night for the Como show. And the following week, we were booked for the Ed Sullivan show and the disappointing, sad part of it was uh, we, the truck we hit, it killed the, the man and, and I lost the brother. Uh, and this was tragedy after success. So for a good while, uh, it just really took the, uh, the good feeling out of the fame the record had. Uh, but now I look at it and I, I can see there were a lot of happy days there too, you know. But has there, has there ever been another real big hit since then? Well, nothing uh, like this one, Bob. I had a thing called Matchbox after that that uh, has been recorded by a good many artists. Uh, in fact, I had the, the the real thrill about three years ago I was working in England on a tour with the, the Beatles and they invited me to their uh, recording session and I was sitting there in the studio when uh, they recorded this Matchbox song and well, that's quite a thrill right there oh you? it really was have you ever been disgusted where you wanted to quit the business completely and uh, just just to, to hell with everything as oh as yeah Yes, definitely, I sure have. Uh, with the ups and downs I've had in the business, uh, more than one time I have uh, 
I've decided, I thought I had decided to uh, go another route, but uh, I had wrapped up so many years of my life and so much of my time in this that I found out uh, I really I wouldn't make a good cab driver or nothing else. I, I, I'd be singing, you know, <laughs> so I wind up back in it. And for the past couple of years, I, I've, uh, I've been blessed with a pretty fair record and then working with the Johnny Cash show and uh, things will look better now than they have in a long time for me. Well, that's very good to hear, Carl, because I do believe you're one of the finest talents in the business and one of the finest persons. And I'd like to thank you for talking with me for all the boys here in Vietnam. Well, Bob, before I go, the, what you're doing is truly one of the greatest things. I know I'm, I'm right in the huddle out there with the fellas listening when I say that uh, they appreciate it. I have been fortunate enough in the last uh, three or four years to make the European tours and play for the fellas. Uh, I've never been to Vietnam. I hope to someday uh, in the little capacity that I could do is pick and sing for them. But everybody has done a great job. And regardless to what uh, the few may protest and say back here, uh, these boys are out there uh, fighting for something that we all know is right and what we love and uh, we all dearly appreciate everything everybody's doing back here. Amen to that, and thank you very much, Carl Perkins. Okay, so that concludes the first interview on this tape. That was the late, great Carl Perkins. Uh, coming up in a future video, we're going to have interviews with the Statler brothers. Uh, also, of course, the interview with Johnny Cash, and also an interview with uh, the Carter family as it existed at the time in 1967, including Mother Maybell and her daughters, uh, along with uh, June, who was uh, not yet married to Johnny Cash in this interview. So uh, kind of an interesting thing there. And to really to hear from Mother Maybell is kind of a real treat because as many of you might know, Mother Maybell Carter is considered the crown queen of country music, uh, being there pretty much from the very inception of the genre. So look forward to that in another video. As you could hear there toward the end of this interview, they got to talking a little bit about Vietnam and the troops in Vietnam, and they seem to be addressing those troops directly. Uh, that was the purpose of these interviews. They were actually taped to be sent to uh, Bobby Wooten's son, who was over in Vietnam, uh, I think he had some possibly some ties with a, ra a radio station over there, and it was supposed to uh, have been sent out over um, Army radio or Navy radio or I don't know what, what kind of radio station they had over there, but that was the purpose of this, which makes it kind of doubly interesting and really starts to come into play when you get into Johnny Cash's interview, which uh, really goes into the war protests and things, which is exceptionally interesting and I think makes that video in particular um, very historically significant. So definitely subscribe to hear that in the future. And for now, we'll see y'all later. Thank you.